Good evening Rowan. It's the 5th of June 2016 and it's about a quarter to twelve and obviously I'm making you my usual Sunday evening video to reassure you I haven't been seducing any priests over the weekend so you can relax once again. Anyway I hope you like my plant by the way the visual aid for this evening because we are going to touch on tree hugging again so I thought the plant would be helpful for you to be studying uh, while we're talking. Anyway so I'm going to comment on a couple of short videos um, that are on YouTube. One of them is part of the interview uh, that you gave which I've shared part of it before where you were talking about the emergent church in the Anglican Communion and making Illuminati hand signs at the same time and you do actually do it in this video as well uh, where you're answering the question about what is the gospel in your own words. So the gospel in a nutshell is that um, if you turn to Christ and repent of your sins you'll inherit eternal life um, and most of the rest of it is detail really so that's really the gospel but uh, this is what you've got to say about it. So you say let's try and put the New Testament context into a slightly more contemporary frame uh, well this sounds really fantastic like you're trying to make it easier for modern people to understand um, but in fact you're not putting it into a slightly more contemporary frame at all you're misrepresenting it entirely as usual so you go on to say in the New Testament era people in Jesus' era were very concerned about who belonged and who didn't belong to the people of God um, and you go on to clarify that saying who really counted as a member of the Jewish people and there were different attempts to answer that question very priestly attempts and very legal attempts and so on um, well this isn't really quite true because there isn't really that much dispute about who belongs to the Jewish people or not because it's a racial identity as well so it's quite easy to determine whether someone is a Jew or not in that sense and even if a Jewish person converts to another religion they're still Jewish so um, in a racial sense I mean uh, so there wasn't really any dispute about who was Jewish and who wasn't if you've got a Jewish mother then you're Jewish um, so there was some dispute between Jews and Samaritans. Samaritans were a people who had similar beliefs to Jews but were kind of the outgroup with the Jews. They, uh, Jewish people didn't really associate with them very much at the time. Um, so there was that going on and this does appear here and there um, in the Gospels but as to whether people were Jewish or not there wasn't any dispute about that really. People might have been arguing about how best to practice Judaism um, in reference to some of the details about the practice of the religion um, but there isn't really any dispute about who is Jewish or not so you're kind of making that up really. So you say put that into slightly more modern terms uh, so this isn't what you're doing. <laughs> the question is what does it mean to belong with God? What does it mean to be at home with God? To know that you're at home with God? Um, well this really, it isn't, I, I just think this misrepresents the, the, the gospel message. It's very easy to spell out what the gospel is to people if they ask you uh, what it means and if they've got questions about it but you seem more intent on obfuscating and blurring the boundaries so that we can all merge into the bog that there actually isn't any definition this is the emergent church actually undefining Christianity uh, so that there isn't any definition about what is and what isn't Christian and anyone who says there is is some kind of fanatic uh, right wing danger to the public and um, that's the impression that people like you give anyway uh, so you know we do have freedom of religion 
in this country and no one is forced to be a Christian um, but the impression that you give is that there are no boundaries, there are no definitions of what Christianity is and it's all a bit woozy and all over the place um, and the reason for that is because you're trying to subvert um, traditional Christianity to move everyone towards a one world religion of environmentalism uh, which I'll come on to a bit more a bit later on. So you say, Jesus says that to be at home with God and belong with God doesn't begin by ticking the boxes on a list of rules. Um, well, that's kind of the opposite of what he says, actually, because um, when he's criticising religious leaders, he's not criticising them uh, because they're fanatically ticking, uh, <laughs> ticking boxes on a list of rules. I mean, he says... Uh, when he criticises them, that they're not observing the rules enough, that they're very hypocritical. So it's kind of the opposite of what he says. I mean, I quoted the passage before uh, where he was criticising the religious leaders, saying you tithe down to the last of the mint and the dill and cumin, and you neglect the weightier matters of justice, and so on. Uh, so he's not saying they should tick the bo boxes less. He's saying they should tick the boxes more. Uh, so that's quite the opposite of um, what you're saying. Now it is true that salvation comes through Christ, uh, so it is important, um, faith is important, um, but I just want to read a quotation um, from um, something that Jesus said. So this is from Mark's Gospel, um, chapter 10, verses 17 to 22 and uh, this is um, a story about Jesus and things he s says to a young man who asks him how to inherit eternal life. So you say that Jesus says belonging with God doesn't begin by ticking the boxes on a list of rules so this is what happens anyway. Mark chapter 10 verses 17 to 22 um, as he was setting out on a journey uh, this is Jesus. A man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honour your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Um, so you've actually said the opposite of what Jesus said, that... Um, Living a moral life according to the law of God is pretty important, really. Um, that doesn't mean that people are excluded by failing. Um, people can be forgiven um, by repenting of their sins, uh, which you never seem to want to do, or even admit that you've got any. You're absolutely perfect, aren't you? And uh, the only reason anything ever goes wrong is uh, because you're perfect good intentions, uh, running eccentric directions because it's a fallen sinful world and because other people are sinful. It's never got anything to do with you. Uh, so this is why you don't want to think that ticking the boxes on a list of rules is at all important uh, because you're unable to do it and because you have to be superior to everybody if this were important it would mean you weren't superior uh, so that's why you've inverted reality so you go on to say it doesn't begin by your inheritance and it doesn't begin in ritual it begins in trust and I think that's just as simple and contemporary as it was in first century Palestine. You, you're just making this up. It begins in trust. Jesus says to his contemporaries, If you trust me when I tell you what God is like, and if you accept the welcome that I'm telling you God offers you, then that's it. 
so Jesus actually doesn't say anything of the sort. In fact, he never um, says to trust him. He never really says to trust anybody. I mean, um, there's a bit of um, a blurring of distinction between the words faith and trust, but um, not that much really. And he does say things to people like, your faith has made you well um, when he heals them. <laughs> Sorry, it just makes me laugh, the stuff that you make up. Anyway, oh, and the other thing as well, uh, when you say it doesn't begin in ritual, well, Jesus did observe the rituals of the Jewish faith. He observed the Passover. Um, there's an account of this in Matthew um, chapter 26, verses 17 to 19. Um, that's one example of Jesus sharing the Passover and observing the Passover with his disciples. Um, and then, of course, he institutes the Eucharist as well, um, which is performed in a ritual way. Now, I could read something from the Gospels where um, Jesus institutes the Eucharist, but a better example of how this is then performed in a ritual way as an important part of Christian life comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, verses 23. Um, to 29 so he he says here when he talks about the Lord he's talking about Jesus this is St Paul talking for I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body that is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you pro proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Um, so you do actually emphasise the Eucharist and sacramental acts and sacraments in the church, even though the Church of England only officially recognises two sacraments baptism and the Eucharist. Um, you um, call yourself an Anglo-Catholic when it suits you, so uh, you would think there were seven in that case. Um, but the only reason uh, that you emphasise the sacramental aspect of Christian faith um, is because sacraments are out outward signs of um, inner grace, as kind of invisible things, they're outward signs of that um, and you want to promote environmentalism and earth worship so this is why you emphasise um, this sacramental aspect to Christian faith it's got nothing to do with uh, tradition or things that are taught in the Bible or Jesus saying to do it or anything like that you want to emphasise the sacramental aspect of Christian faith um, because you're heading people towards a kind of materialistic understanding of faith so that's why you do that so Jesus um, he didn't say rituals are more important than anything else uh, but he did institute rituals and he practiced Jewish rituals to say that that isn't important um, just isn't true so then you go on to say, now of course, that then plays itself out in the fact that it gets more and more challenging to trust Jesus. And you say, how do you trust Jesus when he appears to fail and when he appears to die? Um, well, this is a good heresy, isn't it? <laughs> he appears to die. He appears to fail. Uh, well, I don't know what you mean by fail, really, because he was a perfect man. He was sinless and um, he you know he's very close to God and um, obeyed all the commandments in a perfect way that no one else is able to do um, because of original sin he didn't have original sin uh, so I don't you could say he appeared to fail I suppose in that um, he was condemned to death uh, but appeared to die I mean that's a heresy <laughs> 
because if he didn't die on the cross then he couldn't be raised from the dead and that's kind of the most important thing there is about Christian faith. So if he was only appearing to die, uh, well, we might as well all go home. <laughs> How do you trust Jesus when he appears to die? That's just appalling. I mean, how could you even say that and think you could get away with it? That's probably one of the worst things you've ever said in misrepresenting Christian faith. <laughs> so, you then say, well, you trust him because through and in that, his integrity remains, his offer remains, and on the far side of the crucifixion, the same offer is made. So the far side of the crucifixion, well, he was laying in a tomb, wasn't he? <laughs> so, oh, well, obviously, if he only appeared to die, then he couldn't have been raised from the dead, could he? So you've shot yourself in the foot twice here uh, by saying he appears to die and on the far side of the crucifixion. It's just unbelievable. Nothing can destroy that offer and the whole cost of our own confusion and our own unwillingness to live is sort of eaten up in that act of love on the cross of Jesus. So in a very, very short space, what's the gospel? Trust Jesus when he tells you what God is like. Um, so, well, that's a good idea, actually. Uh, let's trust Jesus when he tells us what God is like. Um, so I've got a passage here, you probably think uh, someone could twist this around to anti-Semitism because uh, you care a lot about anti-Semitism being controlled by the people who created the Third Reich. So I'm sure that's the real reason why you don't want um, sayings of Jesus quoted that criticise corrupt and hypocritical religious leaders and it's not at all because he might just as well have been talking about you. Right, so I had a slight technical hitch there, but here's the passage uh, that I want to read you because you said um, that we should trust Jesus when he tells us what God is like. So here we are, this is what Jesus says. Matthew 21 verses 33 to 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realised that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds, because they regarded him as a prophet. Um, so, that's what Jesus says God is like. So I'd spend some time thinking about that if I were you. <laughs> anyway, I'll leave that there and I'm going to talk about another video in a minute.
Let's try and put the New Testament context into a slightly more contemporary frame. In the New Testament era, people in Jesus' world were very concerned about who belonged and who didn't belong to the people of God, who really counted as a member of the Jewish people. And there were different attempts to answer that question, um, very priestly attempts and very legal attempts and so on. Put that into slightly modern, more modern terms. The question is, what does it mean to belong with God? What does it mean to be at home with God? To know that you're at home with God? Jesus says that to be at home with God and to belong with God doesn't begin by ticking the boxes on a list of rules, and it doesn't begin by your inheritance, and it doesn't begin in ritual. It begins in trust. And I think that is just as simple and contemporary as it was in the first century in Palestine. It begins in trust. Jesus says to his contemporaries, if you trust me when I tell you what God is like, and if you accept the welcome that I'm telling you God offers you, then that's it. Now, of course, that then plays itself out in the fact that it gets more and more challenging to trust Jesus. How do you trust Jesus when he appears to fail and when he appears to die? Well, you trust him because through and in that his integrity remains, his offer remains, and on the far side of the crucifixion the same offer is made. Nothing can destroy that offer, and the whole cost of our own confusion, our own unwillingness to, to live, is sort of eaten up in that act of love the cross of Jesus. So, in a very, very short space, what's the gospel? Trust Jesus when he tells you what God is like. Right, so this is a video interview you gave for an organisation called the Network of Wellbeing. Um, so, this is what you say. I think we're at a point of genuine cultural crisis in the West, where we're in danger of being strangled stifled by what we think is knowledge and what we think is expertise. That might actually be true, actually, because <laughs> we've been stifled by people um, and strangled by people who are giving us false information, but unfortunately you're one of them. So you go on to say, we're bound into short-term problem-solving, anxious, control-orientated policies in every single area of our lives, from education through to technology, and that is making us diseased. Uh, so what you want, rather than a problem-solving approach, you don't like a problem-solving approach because it solves problems. Um, and other people commented on the fact that you like to avoid closure and to keep everything up in the air for as long as you possibly can. Uh, so that's why you don't like a problem solving approach because you want to suggest that we need some whole new political system like a world government and world communism and so on. Um, so instead of allowing people just to solve problems you like to keep everything as confused and up in the air for as long as possible. So then you say, it's possible for people to live w with about 5-10% to 10 of their humanity really engaged. <laughs> You're just making this up, aren't you? You're just making it up. 5% of their humanity engaged. So that means that people are not engaging 95% of their humanity. This is just complete lunacy. What does it even mean? It doesn't mean anything. So you're saying here that people are living with 5-10% to 10 of their humanity really engaged. Lots of people do. And that's really not good enough. <laughs> You're a complete nutcase. Human beings deserve better. They deserve to have the fullness of their humanity engaged. And it's as we discover more and more what that humanity really entails that we find we have more room for one another, more room for compassion, more room for imagination. I mean, this is just like 
a stream of consciousness. It's complete nonsense. I mean, it's a string of words together that sound sounds quite impressive and poetic, really, but it actually means nothing at all. It's complete and utter lunacy. <laughs> You're trying to make out like you've got some profound insight into life and into people. Um, and you don't really understand anything. You don't understand anything. You're just trying to press the buttons to get the outcome that you want. So you go on to say, a lot of this begins, I think, not in asking, what's going to make me happy? Right, so no one's allowed to ask what's going to make them happy or seek things that are going to make them happy. Um, that's a bad place to start. This is what you're saying. I think it begins in attention. This doesn't really mean anything either. The time taken to attend to something else, not with an agenda that comes from inside, but letting your mind, your imagination, be really shaped by who and what you see. Letting them set the agenda, not you, as you take that in. Uh, so who's going to be setting the agenda for me then, Rowan? You. You're telling me, oh yes, I can't go from any agenda that's on the inside, that's part of my identity, that's part of what I want and what motivates me and stuff like that. I should just let a psychopath like you um, define me as a lesbian and a prostitute, regardless of how I feel about these things myself and tell me I'm not allowed to become a Catholic. Um, you know, that this is a hate crime leaving the Church of England and all that kind of thing. I should just let a psychopathic scumbag like you define me. And the same for everybody else as well. We should just take in what everyone else tells us. Believe everything that's in the media. Believe everything that crap merchants tell us. Crap merchants like you um, about world affairs and about human identity and all that kind of thing. We shouldn't go from anything that we know ourselves or have learnt ourselves we should listen to psychopaths like you well that would be a nice world for you wouldn't it everybody giving you what you want which is what a lot of people have done up until now anyway which is why you're in the situation that you're in and why you turned out the way you did so you then go on to say I think for me as a religious person it's the ground base of meditation you try to make yourself present, actually be there, where you are. <laughs> if you say so. And I think also exposure to the reality of the world. Well, that would be good for you, but you, you're completely out of touch with reality. You live in a fantasy world. The feel of the earth and the grass, the feel of rain, and we want to protect ourselves so often from the basic, these basic physical things. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's nice to stay out of the rain so that you don't get pneumonia or something like that. I mean, this is the reason why raincoats and umbrellas were invented. <laughs> and roofs. <laughs> You're completely mad. You're absolutely mad. The feel of the earth and grass, the feel of rain. <laughs> if there's a big message in this, this is the big message, this is hilarious. If there's a big message in this, this is what you're saying. I think it's perhaps your humanity is more interesting and alive than you could ever imagine. And consequent on that, Give yourself the time and space you need to discover that and in discovering you actually find new ways of connecting with the earth, connecting with the earth and with people around you and I would say too with God. Uh, so you're associating God with the earth and with the collective aren't you? This is just, I mean, it's complete insanity. I don't know how anyone could ever take you seriously when you come out with this total and utter crap. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to say any more about that. It really is just, it's a stream of consciousness. It doesn't mean anything. You're totally mad. You're totally mad. I'm not bothered, actually, if you want to be mad. 
that's up to you. Uh, what I just find so bizarre is how so many people were taken in by you for so long um, and were making out that you were some kind of genius like the like of whom had never lived before really um, and you're just as mad as a hatter. Anyway, I shall leave it there for now but um, I still shan't be seducing any priest during the week or anyone else um, but I'll probably be turning up to arrest you so be alert. Hasta la próxima. I think we're at a point of genuine cultural crisis in the West where we're in danger of being strangled, stifled by what we think is knowledge and what we think is expertise. We're bound into short-term, problem-solving, anxious, control-oriented policies in every single area of our lives, from education through to technology, and that is making us diseased. It's possible for people to live with about 5 to 10 percent of their humanity really engaged. Lots of people do. Um, and that's really not good enough. Human beings deserve better. They deserve to have the fullness of their humanity engaged. And it's as we discover more and more of what that humanity really entails that we find we have more room for one another, more room for compassion, more room for imagination. A lot of this begins, I think, not in asking what's going to make me happy. I think it begins in attention. Um, the time taken to attend to something else, not with an agenda that comes from inside, but letting your, your mind, your imagination really be shaped by who and what you see, letting them set the agenda, not you, as you take that in. Now that needs, I think, a discipline of taking time, of giving space for that. It means setting aside a bit of time during the day for attending to something, and very often it can be a matter of attending to your you're eating and drinking, making sure that if you make a cup of tea, you sit down and drink it slowly, and you don't try and find something else to do while you're doing it. You know, wander around the kitchen with a cup in your hand um, while reading the newspaper. Just absorb it. I think for me, as a, as a religious person, it's, it's the ground base of meditation. You, you try to make yourself present, actually be there where you are. And I think also exposure to the reality of the world, the feel of earth and grass, the feel of rain. And we, we want to protect ourselves so often from those basic physical things. If there's a big message in all this, I think it's perhaps your humanity is more interesting and more alive than you could ever imagine. And consequent on that, give yourself the time and space you need to discover that. And in discovering that, you actually find new ways of connecting with the earth and with the people around you. And I would say too with God.